again welcome dear friends to tonight's webinar on keeping a sense of humor I chose a brief reading from autobiography of a yogi uh, from the chapter a levitating saint uh, Baduri Mahashaya and this is when master Makunda visited him at one point, and it's very brief, but it's very sweet. It tells you um, some of a master's uh, qualities. So the saint, uh, Baduri Mahashaya, is saying to uh, Yogadandaji Mukunda, <clears throat> you go often into the silence, but have you developed Anubhava? He was reminding me to love God more than meditation. Do not mistake the technique for the goal. He offered me some mangoes. With that good-humored wit that I found so delightful in his grave nature, he remarked, people in general are more fond of jala yoga, union with food, than of dhyana yoga, union with God. His yogic pun affected me uproariously. What a laugh you have! An affectionate gleam came into his gaze. His own face was always serious, yet touched with an ecstatic smile. His large lotus eyes held a hidden divine laughter. And I think this is so beautiful because that hidden divine laughter is the soul's laughter. And if it's outward, if it's inward, there's always a soul of joy. It's a part of who and what we really are. And I feel that humor is just a little bit of a doorway if it's used rightly. It opens the way for more of that divine joy to come. And Yoganandaji he often worked with his disciples on not being so uh, serious all the time or intellectual um, or uh, not having the lightness and joyfulness within their hearts. And when Swami Kriyanandaji came to Master, he uh, told him that he said, you must get more devotion, more openness, more receptivity. And and he told him that uh, he had to work on that. And so at one point, Master took Swamiji uh, out to 29 Palms Retreat in the desert. And when he was there one evening, he had Swamiji in the room with him and another disciple. I don't know if others were there, but he had this one disciple go out and fetch something for him. It was a bag. And Master, she gave it to him, and, uh, and then he had her turn the lights off. And you may have heard this story before, but it's pretty amazing because Swamiji was very new. He was inexperienced in the yogic path, at least in this lifetime. He was, he was very intellectual. He thought a guru, a master, never laughed and never had any humor. Uh, was always super serious and um, kind of heavy. And, and so Master uh, had this disciple, the other disciple, turn the lights off. And he reaches into the bag and he has a little spark gun, spark pistol, and he shoots some sparks up in the air. And, uh, you know, he has looks at Walter, we call it Master, and, Swamiji didn't know what to think. He's seeing these sparks in the air from this little toy pistol. And now uh, Master looked and he looked and and then he had something else in the bag. He pulled it out and he it's another little toy uh, pistol and he shot up a, like a parachute and it came down. He had the light come back on. Came down real slowly and and they, they all just looked at it as it came down slowly and watched it go all the way down to the ground. And um, I mean, you can imagine how Swamiji felt. He didn't know what to think. Master looked at him 
deeply in the eyes and he said, how did you like them, Walter? That's what he called him. And Swamiji said, well, you're fine, sir. And he didn't have a response. And Master said, he quoted the words of Jesus Christ. He said, suffer, which means allow, suffer the little children to come unto me because of such is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning that there has to be an openness, there has to be a, a childlikeness, a receptivity um, coming from the head to the heart, uh, being able to feel, being able to perceive, being able to intuit. All of these come from um, an inner openness, uh, not from the brain. And so Yoganandaji worked with his disciples to get them to be more balanced. He didn't want Swamiji uh, not to have the keen intelligence he had, but he wanted him to have a balance so that um, he would be able to perceive God deeply within himself. And so he, he also had fun, you know, it wasn't, uh, he wasn't a stern disciplinarian. I mean, he did what was appropriate for the moment. Um, but um, there were wonderful stories. There are wonderful stories of Master just, in, just having fun. There was one story of some of the children, I think this was at his Ranchi school, and they were quote unquote meditating. And a master came behind them and he had some little balled up paper and that he had rolled up and, and uh, he started to throwing them at the back of the heads of the children. And so they didn't know he was there. And so he'd throw it and they, you know, they'd look around and he would hide and then he'd come back and he'd throw it at another one. And, and they thought the other one did it, he punched this guy. And you know, so he just, and then finally they saw it was him. But now why did he do that? Just such sheer fun and sheer joy. And there was a story of uh, Dr. Lewis, who uh, Master was resting one day. I think it was in Sanitas, but I'm not absolutely sure. And Dr. Lewis came into the room while Master was uh, so-called asleep. I don't think he slept very much at all. Dr. Lewis wrapped a thread around Master's big toe and he connected that string to the uh, door and he was just about to, you know, pull the door so that it would pull out Master's toe, thus his leg, and wake him up. So he was just getting ready to pull at Master. What's going on here? But they just were enjoying just the joy of God. And uh, there's also, I, I read a couple of other funny stories where Master had this secretary, his name was um, Rashid, and this was, I think it was early on when he was in America. And Rashid, he always had excuses for why he wasn't at the office and helping Master, and he said, oh, this happened, and ah, oh, this happened, and of course, Master read everybody's mind. He knew exactly what was happening. Rashid was, he had a girlfriend, or girlfriends, different uh, times, and so Master, uh, one day, I mean, just such a funny story, he followed Rashid to, um, he said he had some business to do, and Master followed him. And Rashid has had this uh, girlfriend waiting for him in the park. So he sat there, and there's the girl, and, and he's just had his arm around her, and Master hid in the bushes. I mean, just gotta love this story. And as soon as Rashid was getting ready to embrace the girl, Master said, Rashid, really loud. And of course, he just jumped up. And, and Master says he never had any more problems with him at work, at the office. But I mean, it just was natural, enjoying life. And I, I want to read you this next story because uh, this was about when Guruji was, he traveled quite a bit. And um, at one point, this one story, he was with Dr. and Mrs. Lewis, and they had, I don't know where they had been, but they had just gotten back, and they had eaten at this, uh, this Chinese restaurant, um, and so then they were back at the hotel, so they were exhausted. 
at least the Lewises were exhausted. Master didn't seem to be very exhausted at all. And so uh, they had adjoining rooms, and um, the Lewises said, well, you know, this telling him kind of pretty clearly, we're going to sleep, we're tired. So let me read you this little part here that from the new path. After they said, we're going to sleep, Master, it says, Master, however, had other ideas. Mrs. Lewis and I went to bed. Master, apparently submissive, laid down on his bed. I was just getting relaxed, and Mrs. Lewis was beginning to drift peacefully off to sleep, when all at once, Master, as though with deep relevance, said, Sub gum. Nothing more. Sub gum was the name of one of those Chinese dishes we'd eaten earlier that day. I smiled to myself, but Mrs. Lewis muttered with grim earnestness, he's not going to make me get up. A few minutes passed. We were just drifting off again when suddenly in marvelous, marveling tones, sub gum duff. Master pronounced the words carefully, like a child playing with unaccustomed sounds. Desperately, Mrs. Lewis whispered, We're sleeping! She turned for help to the wall. More minutes passed, then very slowly. Super! Sub! Gum! Duff! The words this time were spoken earnestly, like a child making some important discovery. By this time, I was chuckling to myself, but though sleep was beginning to seem rather an impossible dream for both of us, Mrs. Lewis was still hanging on fervently to her resolution. More minutes passed, and then the great discovery. Super submarine, sub, gum, duff. Further resistance was impossible. Howling with merriment, we rose from the bed. For the remainder of the night, sleep was forgotten. So you can see what a, a balanced life Master presented to, to the disciples. And as you think about it, humor, what does it really mean? It means freedom to be able to smile. I have seen so many people who come onto the spiritual path and uh, they're very glum and heavy and oh, it's so hard and it's bleak. And, but as you meditate, you become very joyful. You be, your consciousness becomes very expansive. You become more, you feel freer inside from moods and habit patterns and worries and fears and, and heaviness. And I remember someone asked uh, Naiswami Jaya, they said, uh, now what are your, uh, what uh, cities do you have? This was at one of the talks that we gave. I can't remember where it was. And, um, and he said, you've been on this path for, you know, many decades, almost, I think, almost 50 years. He said, now what, what have you achieved? What are the cities that you have? And, and uh, Jayaji said, well, I, I don't think I have any cities. And, um, you know, the person was like, oh, what? I'm not going to be on this path. And so then he said, but wait a minute, maybe I have one. And the man was waiting. And so Jayaji said, I have the city to be able to be happy at any time. And what a beautiful answer. Happy to be free to be happy at any time. That means at any time, the energy can rise up to the higher centers. You can focus it here. You can feel light. You can feel freedom. And when we're talking about um, humor, um, humor is a doorway to that. Uh, being able to laugh freely. I know many people laugh um, at people only. But, you know, laughter is just... It, I remember when I was... I was a child, and, and uh, I was always just very happy, and uh, we laughed all the time in our house. There was two, I had two brothers and two sisters, and the sisters came a little bit later, but the, 
the brothers and I, I mean, we were just, we were happy children. And um, we would play this game called Make Me Laugh. And you, you know, whatever you could do to make the other person laugh. And it seems like such a, a silly thing, but it was the direction that we were going in. We were happy. We were joyful. And I remember um, it had nothing to do with anything. It wasn't because we had a new ball or we, we went to Disneyland or whatever. It was just the sheer happiness inside. And then uh, I recall after, after a little while that, you know, later in the teenage years and, you know, going to college and all, I remember I lost that, that free spirit of just being happy for no reason. And then I started looking for that happiness. I started looking for it in, you know, things and people and circumstances and job and car and money and, and, and I wasn't so happy anymore. And I lost the humor in life. I was more, oh, if this doesn't happen, I want to be happy. And, but we, when we practice yoga, this naturalness of the heart and the soul and the natural joy of our soul comes out again and we become more and more free. And uh, I realized that only on the spiritual path was I ever going to find that inner happiness, the inner joy again. And would I be able to just laugh spontaneously? Many people and laugh after, you know, at parties and you hear this loud laughter and, you know, this, um, it's very outward, very emotional. Um, people, maybe they're drinking and then they start laughing and, but I've been at uh, many uh, times with Ananda people where, you know, like our meetings, we have meetings, we had a meeting today, there's so much laughter. I mean, just like, it's just, it's natural. Um, at, uh, satsangs, there will always be some time for laughter at a class or whatever. It's a part of life, uh, humor and laughter. And you feel that as you grow stronger and stronger on the path, it's much more uh, natural. Um, but sometimes people get off and they go in the direction of, as I was saying earlier, that the spiritual path has to be this and you can't even smile. and and um, I think people have just gone too far in that direction. They may be on a fast or a diet or whatever, and their joy goes away. And um, what we want to do is balance ourselves, so that's always there. There's a beautiful saying by um, St. Francis of De Sales. He said, a sad saint is a sad saint indeed. And so the, the joy of the soul has to come up as we, as we meditate and as we serve and as we're on the path. Um, I remember with uh, Swamiji that, and you know, I just read you, told you many stories how Master would laugh, and, and he never got out of, it never got out of hand. It wasn't out of control, but uh, he had that sense of freedom to be able to smile and laugh. And I remember Swamiji, Swamiji would, I would just love to be with him when he had so much wonderful joyfulness. And when in the community at Ananda, I was there for many years, and then also in Italy and here in India and all, when, when things got a little um, heavy or people, Swamiji felt people were too rigid or too tight or too uh, worried about whatever it was, and, he would often have us over to his house, and he would read from the great uh, humorous P.G. Woodhouse, his stories. And everyone would laugh, and Swamiji, to hear him laugh. I mean, sometimes I have those talks now. They were recorded, and sometimes I play them just to hear his laughter, because it was just so free and so uplifting, and the stories so funny. And it's a wonderful thing to keep in mind, to keep, you know, you may get those talks if you don't have them, they're available. Or, um, you know, keep some light, funny stories that you can read from time to time. So that keeps your, your energy up. 
And no matter what the circumstances were, I never saw Swamiji um, not able to be free, to laugh, to smile. Um, he was, he had many surgeries, uh, and once he had, um, he had hip surgery on one hip, then he had hip surgery on the other hip, then he had to have the other, first hip done, redone, and uh, I remember it, we were, I can't remember exactly the context, but um, people were feeling badly for Swamiji. Oh, you had to have the other hip redone, and you had to go back to the hospital and the doctor, and, and Swamiji's response, he just lifted the energy up. It was so beautiful to see. He just went hip, 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 hooray! You know, he just was like, let it go, be free. And he was always just happy that way. And I remember another time when he was in the hospital, and uh, he was in the hospital many times, but he was always just so, he was so free. And uh, he, there was someone, different ones of us took turns to sit with him and be with him. And um, you had maybe an hour, two hours you could be there with him, which, well, what a great blessing. So I remember going in with someone at one point to be with Swamiji, and, and when we went in the hospital in his room, he was sleeping, and so he sort of tiptoed in, and, and we didn't make any noise, and, and uh, then I, you know, I saw this big bowl of fruit that somebody had placed there, and, and uh, I, I didn't pay much attention to it. I was just sort of praying for Swamiji, and, and the other person was going, <laughs> It was so funny. They were going closer and closer to that big bowl of fruit because it had some good-looking mangoes in it. And uh, so then they had their hand just, just primed on one of the mangoes. And Swamiji, before this, he you know, honestly, I think he was asleep. And the person just had their hand just ready to get one of those mangoes. And Swamiji said, why don't you have a mango? And it was just so much fun. And the person went, oh, no, that's okay, Swamiji, so we have a mango. But just, just keeping things in perspective and light and the spiritual path that I, I, I've kept in mind that everything that we do on our, the path is joy producing. Energization is joy producing. Um, uh, yoga postures, it, all of these practices, if you do them properly, they bring the energy up the spine to the level of joy. So as you energize, when you're done, there's a level of joy there. And um, one disciple, Swamiji, told us was um, he would he would you know do his energization really vigorously, and he'd outwardly be saying, "Pump it in, Divine Mother, pump it in," and just with enthusiasm and cheerfulness, and you know instead of just sort of barely doing it. He just did it with the joy of God. And uh, same with the Hatha Yoga. If you see, you see people who, um, you know, they're in a twisted pose and they just look so unhappy. And where's the joy there? If it's not producing joy, why are you doing it? So you may have a slim body or you may whatever, but the yoga practices and from ancient times, they all produced joy. It's a wonderful thought to keep in your mind. And um, meditation produces joy. Master said doing Kriya properly, there's a, a definite feeling of bliss in the spine. And as you feel that and you go through your day, many things happen. Some don't feel so good, some are fine, and some people you like, some people maybe not so much. But with that, I, I recall on the path, all the years that, that uh, I followed these teachings and done all the practices, the meditation, the yoga, and everything, no matter what the outer circumstances were, there was always, even if I couldn't feel it that much, I could feel a little bit, there was always a sense that there was a river of joy there and that I could dip down into that joy and the smile would come back on my face. and. You know, and so humor is kind of a, it sort of pushes you in that direction. If you every day try to um, find some way to give joy to others and give joy to yourself. 
uh, even through just the practices, doing the practices as you meditate, feel that you're meeting joy halfway, you're meeting happiness halfway, you're letting go of the worries and the doubts and fears. Just, just let them go as you do your Hatha Yoga as well. Just as you inhale, feel you're uplifting the energy to a level of joy and all the things we do, the chanting and and these books I, I read from today, Autobiography of a Yogi and the New Path, they have wonderful stories in them, some very funny stories. And, you know, every level, some very deep, some very touching and all, but I, I would take the time, if you feel like you're kind of a dour person and you don't find anything to be happy about, I would read some of these stories and I read one every day and think of it as medicine. Uh, to, to uplift you and to open the doorway to joy. And uh, you will find more and more as you, as you practice, then these things will come. What you can do uh, to um, enhance the level of, of finding the joy or humor in your life, one thing I said, find some, some humorous stories, and I would start with autobiography in the path. There are some hilarious stories. Also, a biography has that Rajiv's, Rajid story um, uh, that I told you about. What was his name? Rajid? Yeah. The story I just to told you about that fellow. That story is in there. Are many other just really, really fun and wonderful stories. Another thing is, uh, Try to be with other people who are more light and more free and more happy. And, um, you know, satsang with guru bhais, um, you're going to have a good time, typically. And as I say, in, you know, in our, in our meetings that we have and times that we're serving, um, if we're doing a work day or save a day, uh, if we're doing a rehearsal with a choir, or if we're doing a kirtan, practicing for a kirtan, or we have a class to do, or whatever it is. It's, it's always a, just a very uh, wonderful vibration of happiness and joy that's there. That It has nothing to do with anything except for the deep, it's the deepest aspect of your soul. And so be with other people who are uplifted and, and light and joy and, and aren't afraid to laugh, um, just innocently. Um, in a way like, uh, in a childlike way. And you will find that you can discover again that part of joy that's within you. The last thing I'll say is, um, Master said, if you can't, just can't find the humor or joy in your life, he said, physically take your fingers and put them on the outer corners of your mouth and lift your, the sides of the mouth up so that you can begin to smile. And if you get in the mirror and you try that technique, you, I mean, I, I don't think you can resist smiling, probably even laughing. And so bring humor into your life in a, in a kindly way. We don't want to laugh at someone, but um, I know Master and I've seen Swamiji laughing so hard at times where there are just tears rolling down their face. and. And I've had those kind of times too, when I was with the Guru Bai, and it really, I mean, it really had nothing to do with anything. But some, for some reason, we started laughing, and, and I just think that's just such a, such a sweet way to share. And, and, and it's, it's really a doorway that opens a door of joy that's within ourselves and opens a door of bliss and of happiness. And so um, it's not a side issue, it's something that we all should do. And as we proceed in that way, um, we will find more and more the joy of God within our own souls, within our beings. God bless you all.